alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. I am uh, Abdul Rashid Amin Haji, Secretary General of International Union of East Turkestan Organizations. Now here from the International East Turkestan Symposium uh, with the slogan Assemble for East Turkestan. Alhamdulillah, there are very respect names of Muslim communities from 40 countries assembled for East Turkestan. It is the first time since 19 is to witness such a great event. The first time we prove it to the world, especially the China, where we, the Muslims of East Turkestan, have their uh, brothers and sisters, their imams, their politicians, their academics, their uh, muftis around the world support us, love us, and defend us. It is now the China is not in the trouble with all, only 40 million uh, East Turkestan Muslims. Actually, they are in trouble with. Uh, two billion Muslim community around the world. So today, the, thir uh, the third day of the symposium was very, very great. The Professor Khaled talked about uh, Chinese threat to the Islamic world by imposing and exporting the more dangerous version of Islamophobia. And uh, Mr. Anas Tikriti also contributed to the symposium with the great, uh, his great ideas speeches. He's the one who speaks and supports our cause from the long time. Alhamdulillah, Jazakumullah khairan. Now I will forward my uh, questions to you. Uh, the first question is, how was the symposium and what are you expecting uh, from this symposium in the future? Um, it was a great gathering of, of minds and a great gathering of activists, uh, also some politicians, some uh, legal experts. So the gathering itself in terms of the names that, uh, that were inside uh, the room, as well as the subjects and topics that were discussed, I think make this quite a historic uh, event. Um, what remains to be seen is how, man how many of those ideas can be then interpreted into real-time actions. I think that that is the real question. There were many, many suggestions, many proposals, many initiatives that were suggested. How many of those can we actually take to implement? I think that will be the mark of how great this, uh, the, this conference really was. Thank you, thank you. Uh, what do you think, say about this topic in the future? What's yeah, to, to echo his points, I think it's a historic moment. I think that this is this solidifies the fact that the, the Uyghur struggle for self-determination isn't only a regional issue, it's, it's a universal human rights issue, and it's definitely an issue that, uh, you know, Muslims globally, especially us Muslims in the West, have to champion moving forward. Uh, you know, and move from ideas to action, I think, is the next critical step. So, uh, Professor Khaled, you mentioned in your speech calling on uh, Islamic world that uh, the helping East Turkestan in short term is helping yourself in the long term. Yeah. So, can you talk about this a little bit? Yeah, so I think it's important to sort of look, you know, governments act based on interests and Muslim majority governments, you know, clearly act in line with their economic and political interests. I think it's naive for us to think that uh, Muslim majority governments or even societies are going to align themselves with the Uyghur people just because they have a religious commonality or religious affinity. But the reality is this, beyond just religious affinity, Muslim societies and Muslim governments have a very, you know, stated and poignant alignment of interest to act against China because many of these, you know, nefarious surveillance technologies, oppressive, uh, you know, architectures of, uh, of surveillance are being imported into Muslim countries and Muslim societies in real time to crack down on, you know, various segments and elements of, uh, you know, Muslim society in places like Egypt. Uh, groups like the Muslim Brotherhood, for instance, not even the Muslim Brotherhood, but anybody who is perceived to be a pious and a devout Muslim is viewed through the lens of, you know, being aligned with the Muslim uh, Brotherhood. In countries where the war on terror is being expanded, uh, you know, the conflation with Muslim identity and terrorism obviously um, leaves many Muslims vulnerable. So Muslim societies have to realize that these um, surveillance strategies and technologies that are being used against the Uyghur in East Turkestan are coming um, to, into their neighborhoods and into their communities. Sure. So, uh, per, uh, Mr. Uh, Anes, so what do you say on this topic as a strategist? Well, um, I mean, I, I, of course, echo what, uh, what Khaled has just said. And I think that in your introduction, you said that China is not only targeting 40 million Uyghurs, but also 2 billion Muslims. Actually, I would suggest that actually it's targeting the vast majority of humanity. Because, I mean, there is an essential issue that we need to recognize here. When we talk about East Turkestan, we're talking about a state under occupation. And the fact that the world is allowed or has been allowed for decades to allow the state of occupation to pass means that no one has the right to claim back their rightful lands. You know, we lose the argument for, let's say, Palestine if we accept 
what's happened there. We lose the argument for Kashmir. We lose the guy. And I'm talking here not the religious as much as the human, the humane, uh, civilizational, cultural, ethical sorts of, uh, of, of demands. So uh, the, the, the battle is, is truly global. It's something that needs to be recognized on a global level. What we're, we're confronting is something that uh, pertains to our set of, of values as human beings. And it's something that um, whilst today many uh, governments and states around the world are showing support or expressing support for East Turkestan and the Uyghur people, we must recognize, just like Khalid said, that much of this is for um, temporary interests. How do we create a culture within the nations of the world that this is something that we cannot expect, uh, accept? So that even when states come to change their positions because of the change, changing climates of interests, people will remain steadfast in the fight for right, righteousness. Okay, thank you. So, uh, the, my third question is, how the, how the Islamic world important in the uh, East Turkestan cause, how they can do for us? Well, um, uh, sadly, uh, sadly, we're seeing the least kind of action uh, in, in places where there should be the most. Um, and uh, whilst it seems that many are valuing economic interests, um, as well as some strategic interests over humanitarian issues and, and, and righteousness. Um, I, this does not reflect, I believe, the, the, the stand of people, the stand of nations. There is this fragmentation between the official state mm -hmm. and policy as, and, and, and the people. The people do believe in what is right. And they know that uh, the Uyghur people have been uh, victimized now for decades. Mm -hmm. And they stand by them. What they can do, well, uh, they must continue to be reminded of the, of the immense danger of Chinese expansionism, whether it be economic or cultural, ideological, or even strategic in terms of their footprint. I mean, let's not forget that the, uh, through the, the, what's called the New Silk Road, I mean, uh, now Pakistan, Afghanistan, you know, even parts of Iran uh, mm. to, the, uh, to the Persian Gulf are, you know, are well trodden by, by China as well as in Africa and the such. So, in a way, uh, the Chinese presence is real. The Chinese presence is real. Uh, plus, you know, the kind of uh, ec economic prowess that China demonstrates. It's a real threat, and, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's high time that um, Arab and Muslim countries, as well as their people, come to recognize that this um, fight for the people of East Turkestan is actually a, quite a unique opportunity in terms of pushing back China and exposing it for what it really is. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Sir. So, uh, do you want to say something about this topic, uh, some contribution to this topic? How the Islamic world can do that? I think that's a great point. I think viewing it as an opportunity to sort of stifle Chinese expansionism in the Middle East, North Africa, and the broader Muslim-majority world is an excellent way to frame it because, you know, again, you have to understand that, you know, Chinese global expansionism is parasitic, meaning mm -hmm. that it only benefits the Chinese, uh, you know, state and the Chinese government. And, you know, one example is when China comes in and assembles the architecture of, let's say, you know, Angola, hypothetically, right? It's only, it's only hiring Chinese employees. Um, it's only, you know, sort of advancing Chinese business and economic interests. It's not benefiting, some, you know, symbiotically the interests of, uh, you know, the host Angolan state. And that goes across the board. So Muslim majority uh, governments have to understand that the economic sort of, you know, the economic interests of China are slated against its interests and not sort of like fall prey to the short term sort of allure. Um, you know, a financial gain that isn't truly financial gain. And one that's, once, once that's exposed, I think that uh, it's easy to see that Muslim-majority governments um, should not sort of like fall prey to Chinese expansionism. Yeah. So uh, the, my last question, as the most influential names of the Muslim community, especially in the West, how do Muslim communities in the West can contribute to our cause? Can, uh, how they can support us? Well, firstly, by um, not only supporting the current stands which are positive, um, in my case in the United Kingdom, across many European countries. In the case of Khalid, for instance, in the United States, there are many positive statements being, being made. Not as, they don't go as far as we want them to. They, they're not going as far as we need them to be, or in fact, they're not going as far as they should be going, but they're positive. 
those should be solidified. They should be promoted. They, those should be pushed forward so that basically there are advancements in those particular positions. That's, that is for one. The second is, it's imperative that those who are aware of what's happening mm -hmm. frame the narrative and project it so that it's understood by the Western communities as well. I mean, we have an interest that British society, in my case, understands the case of the Uyghur, not only through the, the perspective that is being um, uh, given or portrayed by the government, but through what's actually happening on the ground. And it's also vital that this dimension that we share, the dimension of faith, of creed, of culture, of language even sometimes, is, is seen that we have a relationship to the people in East Turkestan. So we're not talking about some aliens, you know, in a, in a faraway planet. We're talking about people who relate to us, whom we belong to and whom they belong to us. So this, is, this helps in promoting a different form of a narrative, which I feel uh, keeps the pressure on the governments uh, to continue to push against China and hopefully not then regress when it feels that its national interests aren't served anymore. Okay. Uh, what's, what's your from your perspective? Yeah, I think that, look, the, the United States and American society is a unique animal in many regards. We're less sort of, you know, international in framing as, you know, British, British people are. Um, we're, we're, we're a stupider society, to be frank with you. <laughs> we're, we're, we, we're not keen on looking beyond the bounds uh, of our borders. But the point, uh, the point made about... I think mass education is still really important in the United States because, you know, few and far between, there's, there's very minimal knowledge about what's actually taking place in East Turkestan. I think the vast majority of Americans don't even know who the Uyghur people are. They can't distinguish them from, from Han Chinese people as a consequence of that ignorance. So that level of education has to be the first step. Um, and that's what I try to do with sort of a, you know, a public thinkers to, you know, educate American audiences. The second point is also a really important one because in the United States specifically, you have to deliver the message in a way that is palatable to what they understand. So I'll give you a quick example. So young people in the United States are becoming far more politically uh, conscious than previous generations as a consequence of the Black Lives Matter movement, right? So to draw a connection with what's happening with the Uyghur people, with the Black Lives Matter struggle, would be a very resonant way to sort of penetrate the message with, with young people. Or Palestine, obviously. You know, Palestine holds a, you know, a very sort of essential... Uh, you know, presence in the minds of human rights and civil rights struggles across the world. And clearly the analogy between what's happening in East Turkestan and, and uh, Palestine is very strong. Yeah. Yeah. So um, framing the message in a way that people understand the East Turkist, uh, the struggle of the Uyghur people with the struggle of the Palestinian people, for instance, would be a great way to like deliver and deepen the message. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your time. Uh, uh, on behalf of this Cloud TV, I thank uh, you, uh, Mr. NS Security and Khaled Bey, Professor Khaled Bey, to you. give your time to and talk uh, and answer my question. Jazakumullah khairan. Thank you very much.